Good morning, everyone. Um, I was going to say I was pleased to be here, but that line has already been taken. Uh, at this stage of my life, I'm pleased to be anywhere. Uh, it also, uh, but what pleased me was the opportunity to take a minute to think back to some beginnings, which for me really weren't beginnings because uh, when I had my first library job, I provided a location in the library, in that very small city library for a Laubach tutor uh, to meet with her student uh, who she was tutoring uh, to learn to read. And that learning from Teresa Trucheau, who was this spindly little thing of about 87 years old, that reading was one of the most valuable things you could pass on to someone else, was an inspiration that would follow me for a long, long time into today. Serving as the State Librarian of California from 1980 to 1994, I followed the Taxpayers' Revolt, Proposition 13, and found myself challenged to encourage libraries to act in new directions and in new ways. We faced times when budgets were being drastically reduced. Elected officials were hard-pressed, particularly in the counties of California, which is the base library service unit in this state, to meet previous commitments to build and support public libraries. The glory days of California libraries seemed to be over. There were three major initiatives of which I am most proud during my years as state librarian. First and foremost is the California Literacy Campaign and its related Families for Literacy program. The Partnerships for Change Initiative and Info People. Each of these initiatives ask libraries to think outside of their traditional roles in a time of budget disaster. A time when it would have been easy to just give up and close doors to think outside of those traditional roles and to prepare for a future that would forever be different because those budgets would never return to the levels that they once were. But we found there was a residual goodwill on the part of the publics that we served and the publics we hoped to serve. And by thinking in new ways, we engaged those publics in new ways. The Rand Corporation study I commissioned in 1987 challenged the very basis of traditional library service in California and forecast a rapidly changing demographic environment which we would need to meet into the future. In 1983, I determined with the support of my consulting staff that we would have to take on a new initiative. Led by then Carmela Ruby, who was an absolute champion in convincing me to um, get brave, as she put it, we envisioned the California Literacy Campaign, and we purposefully called it a campaign we set aside two and a half million dollars of carryover LSCA funding and applications were invited from public libraries. 26 public libraries were granted funds to start the campaign. I recall one letter in particular from a county librarian who um, stated that she really didn't think this kind of thing was the thing libraries ought to be doing, but it was new money and she wanted her share, damn it. <laughs> It didn't take very long. She's now uh, someone, I guess, I wouldn't say who, but I think she's in Washington, D.C. at the moment. It didn't take long for her to become a believer and staunch supporter of what her library experienced. And when she attended her first adult learner uh, program and was introduced to this uh, very striking woman who she thought was the tutor, who just happened to be the wife of the local newspaper individual, owner of the local newspaper, and only to learn along with that gentleman that in fact the wife was the student. It changed her life. The campaign focused on native born adults 16 years and older who spoke English and were below the level of skill that was needed to be enrolled in adult schools across California. There is an enormous backstory, I'm from LA now so we call them backstories, <laughs> for this decision and our early difficult road of collaboration with adult education in California. It was not simple to bring the campaign into being because there was so much turf war going on within education and particularly adult education and I will refer to my battle in New York State in a moment. 
Uh, the then adult ed director in New York State said over his dead body would public libraries ever be educational institutions. This collaboration worked well, however, in California at the state level with close connections into the Department of Education's adult education program. It was their vision along with ours, believing that there was absolutely enough turf for all of us that made it work. But it was on the local level where it was to be challenged time and time again. I recall one adult ed conference where I was invited to speak. I approached the podium and the cat calls began from the audience. About a third of the way into my remarks, the boos were raised from the audience when I talked a bit about sharing funding. Before I could finish, several walked out of the conference hall and I was later escorted out uh, to my car because a group was approaching the podium. It was not a warm, wonderful experience. <laughs> but those times passed and our collaborations grew and as local libraries began to infiltrate and cooperate and partner with community colleges and adult schools, that really turned around significantly. Those of us involved were convinced that public libraries had a significant role to play, even if we had to narrow our scope and what our gut told us we ought to be doing. And the legislature astonishingly agreed. It was a time when there wasn't much bipartisan support for anything in the legislature in California. It was a time when we could not get other funding past the California library. When it, in a time when we could not get other library funding passed, the California Library Literacy Services Act, as a part of the Special Services Program of the California uh, Library Services Act, was passed to designate, uh, des designed to reduce adult illiteracy by providing English language literacy instruction and related services to adults and youth who were not yet enrolled in school, or not enrolled in school. The legislature indeed had confirmed our role and set in state policy the fact that public libraries in California are indeed educational institutions. I am pleased that this legislation was carried jointly by a Republican in the State Assembly, one of the most conservative Republicans in the State Assembly, a later uh, congressman, and the Speaker of the Senate, a Democrat from Los Angeles, one from the Bay Area, one from the North, one from the South. You can imagine the discussions in my hallowed office there in Sacramento as to who we would tap and what we would need to have to make something like this pass in a time when no new programs were being passed in the California legislature. While they would seldom appear together in the Capitol, they made numerous trips to my office together to promote the bill. One such trip, they arrived to have coffee with the First Lady Barbara Bush, who came to champion our cause. They were impressed, to say the least. Uh, this nonpartisan support would be crucial to all of the library issues that we put before the legislature. In looking back, the, the literacy allowed us to bring other issues before the legislature because we had built through that effort a coalition of support that people were proud about. Legislators showed up at local events, at local libraries, at award nights. I recall in particular a night when I was um, down in Calexico to, uh, at a Literacy Volunteers of America event which uh, involved the library and my talk was done and the evening was over and the awards had been passed out and there was this young woman and man in the back who were sort of holding back and others left and the young woman approached me and she said, uh, are you the Gary Strong that used to drive the bookmobile in northern Idaho? And I was somewhat shocked and said, yes. And uh, she looked at me and she had this immense look of relief on her face and her husband even more so. She told me that, um, in fact, she wasn't involved with the literacy program at all. But when she'd seen my name in the paper announcing the event, they bought tickets because when she was in the second grade, I brought the bookmobile to her school in Troy, Idaho. And I found the best books for her to read and she had never forgotten it. Think about the impacts that we have on people's lives in these programs. The following year, we were able to get legislation for the Families for Literacy program through the California legislature. 
The program was structured to help prevent illiteracy through coordinated literacy and pre-literacy services to families that include illiterate adults and young children. It provides reading preparation services for young children in public library settings and instructs parents in the importance of reading to their children. <laughs> Our little way around, you can't teach kids. Uh, that was the other mandate we had is that we schools taught kids. We weren't supposed to play in that other game. That same year, we tried to get legislation passed called the Students for Literacy Program, which would have been a funded work-study program that would bring prospective teachers in colleges into public libraries to work as tutors and get paid for their time. We ran headlong into a broader lobby for student financial aid and became roadkill in the assembly aisles. Over the 10 years, I saw scores of talented literacy services staff embrace public libraries as their new home, and in most cases, public librarians embrace them as partners in the new roles that libraries would take on. Thousands of new adults discovered public libraries where they never would have before. I mean, after all, you do have to read generally to use a public library. And thousands more children were engaged with their parents in public library programs. It, is not a, it was a sea change for public libraries in California who had been committed to the program. I'm sure that Susan could tell you more about what's happened since because I departed in 1994 for another place. I want also to note that in addition to Carmela Ruby and other consultants on the staff in the early 1980s, for example, Martin Gomez wrote the first regulations for the California Library Literacy Services as a young consultant with the California State Library. Al Bennett and Carol Tallon came to work at the State Library and brought energy. Those were the only two consulting positions we got in 15 years. They brought energy and commitment to literacy programs. They were the pioneers and trailblazers along with literacy staff in libraries who took the risk in believing that libraries are places where people go to read. We engaged Jonathan Kozal and Paulo Ferrer uh, in coming to California and talking with us and talking one-on-one -on -one with those who were working in literacy programs across the state. When I went to the Queens Public Library in 1994, I found a vibrant library-based literacy program already in place. So it doesn't only just happen in California. Our six adult learning centers were up and running with funds from the mayor's office of the city of New York, and we were swamped with adult learners. And I wasn't saddled with all the damned constraints that everybody else thought that, we should, that a public library shouldn't be doing. But we were also had developed a fantastic programs for immigrants who, for whom English was not their first language. We believe that reading and writing are essential to maintaining a free and democratic society. Adults in Queens, regardless of native language, should have access to literacy instruction at the library. Because Queens is the most ethnically diverse county in the United States, its two million residents comprise almost every cultural and social background on the globe. Almost half speak languages other than English at home. Some have never attended school as children nor have ever used a public library. Still others, for many reasons, just never learned. Queen's Library's adult learning centers offer several options to learners to obtain basic literacy and skills. Formal classes in English for speakers of other languages, and here's where sometimes we get into different um, connotations. We called it ESOL because in many cases, it wasn't um, English as a second language, it was English as a fourth or fifth language, are offered through the New Americans program and certified ESOL teachers conducting each class. Regular classes and small group instruction for adult new readers are conducted with volunteer tutors. There are conversation groups with volunteers so learners can practice. They go on field trips around the city together and learn from each other and build a network of their own. There are adult basic education classes. There are computer-assisted instruction labs for students learning English or improving their reading skills. Each learner is introduced to the library and almost always becomes a library user and advocate. And in both cases, here in California and in New York, we work to build programs that were truly adult-based. There's nothing more demeaning than to give someone a second grade book and they're an adult. Every library in America needs to make a commitment to literacy and learning. That almost sounds like a given, but I assure you it is not the public libraries. It is not. Public libraries can be involved in the following ways. 
First, be knowledgeable of the conditions of literacy in their service communities and gather information and facts concerning literacy status, service providers, and delivery systems that are available to adult learners. Reference librarians, children's librarians, and reader's advisors are key referral agents to such services on behalf of library customers. Second, develop collections of educational materials, including ones designed especially for adults at low reading levels and containing books that parents can read to their children. I discovered wordless books are the most wonderful things, and, and I still you know, give them as gifts because I just think they're fantastic. Collections should include children, uh, teacher's manuals and tutoring guides. You can provide meeting room space for tutor instruction, local learning councils, learner instruction provided by other organizations. You can participate in community coalitions that focus on adult learning and family literacy, actively advocate approaches that recognize the condition of illiteracy in the community, and work to find community solutions together. Work with adult schools, community colleges, and private providers to ensure that they all that all in need have the opportunity to be served somewhere in the system. And the highest level of involvement is to provide instruction to adult learners in basic English and English for speakers of other languages using the, all of the varieties of mechanisms that we've talked about. Make sure that every adult in a learning program receives orientation to the public library. I'm always amazed when this is forgotten and that they all have library cards and understand what the personal empowerment is that is gained by using a library. I frequent, frankly never thought too much about colleges and universities might have a role in literacy until I took my current position as university librarian at UCLA. Information literacy is a huge component of our instructional engagement in classes across the UCLA campus. Our information literacy librarians work with faculty to embed library components and quality library resources into classes and engage in instruction where appropriate. We work with assessment and partner with various instructional and research units across the campus uh, to make sure that students are prepared to fully uh, access the tremendous resources that can support their learning and research. We define information literacy as a set of skills students need to identify an information need locate information effectively, evaluate information, and use information effectively and ethically. These are skills that students will find essential throughout their undergraduate and graduate careers and beyond. Yet many come to UCLA with crucial gaps in this skill set, and we could talk all day about the failure of the schools in meeting that uh, preparatory need. In closing, the United States is the only country in the world where the Constitution guarantees every citizen the right to be ignorant. And yet, we used to believe that every child, woman, and man had the right to learn to read. And it's in the library that we do that most effectively, I believe. It is our collective responsibility as a society to make sure that the right to be ignorant is one right that our citizens do not choose to exercise. In my opinion, reading is not optional. It is not elective. It is required to secure the other guarantees of the Constitution of a free, enlightened, democratic society. If we are not careful, we shall become the friends of ignorance and the enemies of knowledge, and that will not portend well for this country. We must engage elected officials to understand the important role that access to information makes possible with a sound system of public library services assuring our country's future. But we must not only look back and value the past, we must move vigorously into the future to empower those who will use us. We still have much to do. Each of you can make a difference in someone's life.